Jesus is God. The Gospel of John presents this as clearly as any book of the Bible. How does an encounter with Jesus, the God-man, change people's lives? At the cross, Jesus gave us hope through his death and showed us how to live until then. Well, good morning, CCJ. How's it going? Well, real quickly, before I get going, allow me to have a two-minute commercial. Okay, you okay with that? Yeah. I got a, real quickly got an infomercial. Uh, believe it or not, we are three weeks away from Easter. Uh, it is crazy how fast 2015 is flying by. And if you've been around CCJ at all, you know that this is one of the biggest weekends for us every single year. We, we throw some extra things towards Easter and yet still preach the gospel the same way we do uh, every other week of the year. It's a great opportunity because so many people are willing to come to church with their families that morning and uh, we get a chance to get to a chance to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And this year's no different. We are actually, for the first time in a while, offering a Good Friday service, uh, two of them actually, at 6 and 7.30. We're also going to be having three services on Easter morning at 8, 9.30, uh, 8, 9.30 and 11. And I would really encourage you, uh, the last couple of years, we've had about 2,100, 2,200 people on Easter, almost the exact same attendance the last two years. We want to have 2,500 plus this year, okay? And uh, it's, it's a big goal, yes. Yes, it sounds like we're all about numbers, but for us, numbers represent lives, okay? We want some of those 24,000 outside our walls to hear about Jesus. And they don't need to just hear that in our radio ad or hear that in our newspaper ad. They need to hear it from you. And so one of our challenges we, we want to give you is every single one of you is going to go, get a postcard just like this on your way out. And it just says, who needs to know? And on the back, you can write some names of some people that you think need to be here. Friends, family members, neighbors, coworkers, and, and put this where you can see it, on your fridge, put it on uh, your nightstand next to your computer, and let this be a reminder over the next three weeks to invite some people. I'm going to be writing down some names as well, uh, inviting some of my neighbors to be here as well. And so, man, I hope you join me in this and that we make this the best Easter ever, okay? So that's my two-minute commercial. Well, we'll move on past that now. Well, it is, uh, we, are, we are continuing on, and as we start out, and as I start out this message, uh, I'm going to talk about something that I'm sure almost every one of you know about. It's the dress, okay? I'm sure almost every one of you, unless you've been under a rock, has seen it. I think, it was the, I think it's the picture in the middle of those three was the original one. I have to ask, who saw gold and white? Okay, pretty good group. Who saw black and blue? Okay, was there anybody weird like me in the middle that saw like a, a bluish purple and a brown? There's like three of us. Okay, we're the weird ones. Okay. Yeah, you know, when that picture first hit the internet and basically broke Twitter and Facebook, uh, my community group was actually meeting and trying to have a discussion, uh, and it got derailed very quickly. Thanks to smartphones, we discovered that picture, and uh, Instantly, we all had different opinions of what we were seeing and very quickly became very passionate about what we were seeing. Couldn't believe that anyone else was seeing something different out of that picture than we were. Uh, so passionate that even later on that night after group, we were texting each other, still debating who was right, uh, arguing about who was right. And I, I, I knew it was a big deal. I mean, there's no way we would have found out about it if it wasn't a big deal. But we, uh, I, I left group that night and got on social media and realized how much it had blown up. Uh, I mean, it was all anybody was talking about, and uh, everybody was having the same argument we were. You know, families were being torn apart, marriages were being tested, <laughs> friendships on the rock, all because of this polarizing dress uh, that, that had hit the internet. It was just crazy to me. And uh, everybody, again, everybody had another opinion. It's amazing to me uh, how many people were talking about this over one weekend. In fact, I read a, a report, a, a news article that was done that there was a couple of friends that actually got in a fist fight over this uh, because of their different opinions. I mean, just, just craziness. It was all anybody talked about for one weekend. Hashtag the dress was everywhere you looked. I flipped on, like, the TV. News station after news station were covering it as if it was, like, crucial world news. Uh, everybody was talking about it. Amazing how one picture of one dress can cause so much chaos. 
And I bring that to you, and I, and I mentioned that this morning, not to rehash the argument, uh, since we actually know the dress was black and blue, and we, we know there's some scientific reasons as to why uh, we saw different colors, but rather because this morning we are going to be looking at one of the most polarizing statements Jesus ever uttered in the Gospels. It's a phrase that some people try to stand in the middle on, but Jesus doesn't really allow you to do that. It's a phrase that if it is lived out, has the ability to change the way you operate in relationships and in your life. It comes from John 14, 6, and it just says this, in Jesus' words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Now just hearing that, there's some of us that want to cheer internally. There's some of us in the room that want to cringe internally. There's some of us that want to post it to Facebook, while there's others of us that want to hide it and pretend that it doesn't exist. There's some of us that want to use it as a reason uh, as to why we can act superior, while there's others of us in the room that want to use it as the reason we can dislike Christians uh, and Christianity because it's so narrow-minded. It's polarizing. And yes, this few words from Jesus that he uttered towards the end of his life has got monumental implications on our life. It impacts in so many ways the ability for us to follow Jesus and what it looks like to follow him in our lives. But before I can get there this morning, before uh, I think we can begin to truly understand how big this is and how it applies to our lives 2,000 years later, I think we need to first understand it in its context. We are not a church here that preaches from one verse, okay, and builds a whole theology on it. We look at everything in context of where it was originally spoken, and we want to do that this morning. So if you have a Bible, open up uh, to John chapter 14, starting in verse 1. If you don't have a Bible or electronic device, find a Bible around you. It's going to be on page 648. And it's also going to be on the screens behind me. Follow along, starting in verse 1. This is what it says. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. You know, it's always Thomas. Doubting Thomas, we often refer to him. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still do not know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? you, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. Okay, we are jumping into the middle of a passage there, the middle of an encounter, so let me give you a little bit of a background first as to what's going on here. We've been in a series now for about 11 weeks called Face to Face, where we've been looking at uh, the encounters people had with Jesus during his life and ministry in the Gospel of John. And in this encounter, what we're kind of diving into the middle of is one with Jesus and his disciples the night before he would go to the cross. In fact, Daryl kicked off this encounter last week. It's the same stream of thought uh, in John chapter 13 as Jesus uh, began kind of what we call the Last Supper, uh, the night before he would go to the cross, uh, began kind of uh, showing us an incredible example of humility, of grace and love by actually washing the feet of his disciples, giving us something that we should follow, that we should emulate. What we didn't get a chance to see last week, though, is later on in that chapter what happens. You see, things during the meal get pretty heavy. They get pretty serious. As Jesus, one, predicts that Judas is going to betray him, which actually does, is going to happen, and Judas flees the room because of it. He predicts that Peter is going to deny him, and he also predicts his death and the fact that the disciples aren't going to be able to join him in that that it's something that's not like a battle that they can fight. He's going to have to do it on his own. 
Needless to say, there's a lot of tension in the room. The disciples are on edge, you know, around the table at this moment. Not only uh, are two of their very own been called out by Jesus, but now the man that they've been following for three years, who they've given up their life, Their family, their friends to follow is telling them he's leaving, that he's departing. And so you can cut like the the tension with a knife in the room. They are on edge. They are feeling incredibly nervous. You know, we know the end of the story. They didn't. So put yourself in their shoes for a second. They couldn't even grasp what was about ready to come next. They're on edge, worried, panicked. And it's in this moment in this this awkwardness, in this tension, that's where we pick up in John chapter 14. Jesus beginning to offer some words of comfort to their confusion, to their panic, and to their fear. This is an important moment that's taking place. And I find it kind of interesting that in these waning moments with the disciples, and some of the last words that he's going to speak before his death, Jesus reveals to us in this moment what uh, is kind of most important to him. Something he's talked about before, but here he makes it even more clear. It's his mission to rescue us. You see, he tries to let the the disciples understand and know that what he's doing through his death, burial, and resurrection, he's kind of giving them uh, uh, some foresight as to what's coming at the end of the story. That through his death, burial, and resurrection, that he is going to be creating a path to God and ultimately creating a place for us to spend eternity with him. Now, this is important for us to note because there's a lot of people out there who want to diminish Jesus as to nothing more than like a moral example or a good teacher. Here's the deal, though. Jesus is very clear that he's more than either one of those things. He already knows what he's going to do. He's very clear that he's he's anticipating what is about to come. And he uses it to offer up comfort to the disciples. Here's the problem again, though. They, they just can't even grasp it. It's so far over their head. And so they begin to use Jesus' language and view it and, like, talk back in geographical terms. You know, Thomas, who always seems to be the poster boy for doubt and confusion, speaks up and says, Jesus, we don't really know where you're going or how to get there. I mean, basically, he, he's speaking for the disciples when they say, Jesus, like, man, let us know a, a location so that we can be in the know. Like, give us the GPS coordinates. I mean, put the X on the map. We got to know. And Jesus flips their geographical question and makes it personal. He says, I, singular, am the way. I, singular, am the truth. I, singular, am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus was saying something profound here. The truth, the path, wasn't a principle. It's a person. It's him. In fact, I love what Daryl Box says. It is not so important to know the route that Jesus takes so that one can follow it. What is important is knowing that Jesus is the route to God. You see, Jesus isn't interested in offering up some cliche religious advice here in his waning moments with the disciples. You see, unlike every other religious leader from every other world religion, Jesus isn't interested in his words being centered around like enlightenment or the path to happiness, or to what it takes to appease the gods. Jesus is different, and his words center around his work and his mission. Not what we need to do, but what he's going to do. That's what's most important to him. He wasn't there to start another religion. He wasn't there to just offer up some good moral advice. Jesus is there to create a connection, to restore a relationship between humanity and divinity, between God and man. He's the conduit. That's what he's saying in this passage. Be comforted because of what I'm going to do. And when we understand, that's, that's the encounter. That's the the, the, what we see here. That's where these words, the context in which they take place. And when we understand that, we begin to, to start to be able to peel back the layers and understand what Jesus is saying to us as well 2,000 years later. How, what was happening there, there's some profound takeaways to our day and our time. In fact, with my remaining time this morning, let me connect the dots for you with what Jesus is saying here and how it applies to us 2,000 years later. And there's two big takeaways I want you to get. The first one is this. Jesus' words are exclusive. It's a big takeaway. Jesus' words are exclusive. There's really no way avoiding understanding or seeing this. 
Jesus is making it apparent that the path to God doesn't flow through morality, through spiritual enlightenment, or just being a good person. It flows through him, having a connection, having a relationship with him. And he's very, very clear there, crystal clear at the very end of John 14, 6, where he says that there is no other path to the Father, no other path to God, no other path to heaven than through him. Now, as I said at the onset, this is, this is polarizing. In fact, there's a lot of us, this is a hard like reality for us to come to grips with. Because we live in a culture and we live in a society that prides itself on not ever being exclusive. In fact, we kind of live with the mantra that anything goes. In fact, the only thing that's really not okay in our society is to be exclusive or to act as if you have the only truth. Anything goes, and except if you tell me everything doesn't go. I mean, that's the predominant philosophy of the world that we live in and one that most of our lives have been indoctrinated with. And this philosophy has a name. It's called relativism. I mean, it's been around for a long, long time, but it's just kind of rose to prominence in our recent culture, kind of streaming from the 60s on. And it's just basically this core belief that there are no moral or spiritual absolutes. The truth is relative, hence the word relativism. It's relative to people and to situations. Maybe another good way to define it is words that we've uttered or maybe we've heard uttered. What's true for you may not be true for me. The truth is relative to a situation or to a per person. And again, this is, we've been indoctrinated with this. This is everywhere we look in our society. Uh, in fact, a great example of that is in, a, uh, in one of Disney's latest movies called Into the Woods. Now, I'll try not to, to ruin too much of the movie for you, but basically what happens in this, this movie is uh, kind of a musical. They kind of flip our, some of our famous fairy tales, uh, some of our childhood fabled stories that we love, and kind of flip them upside down and basically take the happily ever after and instead give it us like this jaded, messy view of each of the character's stories. And in the end, uh, kind of the final scene, all the characters play the blame game. They're all upset with where their story has kind of settled, blaming each other for what's going on. And it's in this moment that the witch in the, in the movie actually kind of reveals that playing the blame game is kind of, un, kind of not very helpful. It says, hey, everyone's messed up. Everyone's screwed up. Everyone's a mess. So it's not really helpful for us to blame, for, blame each other. Let's get over it, pick up the pieces of our lives, and move on. And what we're left with, this is kind of the resolution of the whole film, is this sermon in the form of a song. And listen to these lyrics. Wrong things, right things. Who can say what's true? Do things, fight things. You decide, but you're not alone. Witches can be right. Giants can be good. You decide what's right. You decide what's good. It's a sermon on relativism. And I'm, I'm not painting the movie out to be evil or anything. I'm not looking for you guys to like, uh, to like boycott Disney or anything. I'm not one of those Christians. I think that's ridiculous. But what I'm saying is that I want us to recognize the voices that we're hearing. In fact, pr pretty much the, every voice that we hear, everything that we watch, everything that we see, everyone around us is declaring the same fact that there's no lifestyle, there's no belief, there's no way of living that's wrong. You just find what makes you happy, you find what you deem best, and you go with it. Now, I don't have the time this morning to deconstruct this philosophy. I don't have the time this morning to deconstruct relativism. It's for another place and for another time. But I do want to offer up this quick bit of, of advice or thought. I find it very interesting that in declaring and making the statement that there is no absolute truth, that you're making a statement, an absolute statement about truth. That in saying that there's not just one way to go, but multiple ways to go, that you're, in essence, creating a way that everyone else has to merge to in order to live on your terms. I mean, let's be very clear on something. Relativism isn't the absence of exclusive truth. It's just creating a new one for us to follow. Now, some of you are probably already a step ahead of me and already know where I'm going with this. But this has massive implications on the spiritual direction of our culture. 
In fact, what has been birthed out of this relativism movement that is appearing in our society is kind of a universalist approach to God. That there's, you know, we hear it all the time. There's multiple paths to go to God. Like climbing a mountain, there's lots of different paths you can take, and as long as you get to the peak, that's okay. I mean, aren't all religions basically the same thing anyways? Our own view, our own pursuit of God, and our own, our own way. In fact, while there's been some people that have claimed that atheism is on the rise in our culture, uh, when real study is being done, that's not actually true. The greatest increase is the people, when, when, re, when research is done, aren't checking a given religion. They aren't even checking atheism or agnosticism. They're checking other. And they want to like vaguely pursue God in their own way. This vague spirituality. I'm going to do my own thing, and it's okay. I'm a good person. I kind of believe God. I'm going to express that in whatever way I want, and that's okay. And this stream of thought is seeping its way into the church and Christianity as well. In fact, a study that was done six years ago, so I'm sure it's much higher now, showed that 54% of Christians believe and when asked that there is more than one way to God, that Jesus isn't the only way. In fact, I've had a lot of conversations recently with some people in our own church on this very subject, and I would guess that we're not too far off those statistics ourselves. Now, if that's you this morning, let me just first say this. I get it. I, I mean, I understand how, how we get there, how we re- arrive in that destination. I, I understand because for some of us, we don't want to be viewed as bigots. We don't want to be viewed as hard-hearted people. We don't want to be viewed as jerks, which is kind of what Christians are being painted out to be in our society. It's not very easy to stand up and say there's one way and one God, so we just don't. I mean, it's just much easier to just accept everything and love everything and just be all right with everything and not ever say anything. I also understand because for a lot of us, we know and love people who aren't following Jesus. We're related to them. We're married to them. We're parents to them. We're siblings to them. We're friends with them. We're coworkers with them. And the idea of them not being with us for eternity, it just sounds crazy. I mean, in many of these instances, these people are kinder, nicer, and more moral than we are. In our mind, how in the world can we be all right with God and them not be? How can we be going to heaven and they can't be? And so we settle into this this worldview, what it looks like. But here's the problem, church. Jesus doesn't allow us that luxury here. He's very abundantly clear that, you know what? Truth isn't a philosophy. It isn't a way of life, and it isn't a principle. It's a person. It's a relationship with the one who defied what we could believe and made it true. In fact, I love what Paul declares in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says, for there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus And you see, Jesus can make this exclusive claim and Paul can declare this exclusive claim because of what we're going to celebrate on a few weeks on Easter. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, if he really did defeat death and the grave, if those events really did happen, events that would cause the disciples to lose their lives, events that would cause thousands of people in the coming years to give their life to Jesus and be persecuted for it, events that have stood the test of time and criticism for 2,000 years, then Jesus did something that has never been done up until that point and has never been done since. He gets to make an exclusive claim because he defied the natural world. And that's why I say all the time for us in Christianity, it starts and ends with the resurrection. Either you believe it or you don't. It's kind of argumentative. It's kind of something that that puts us in different camps on its own right. But church, understand this. There's nowhere to stand in the middle. Jesus plus something else's truth is denying what he says about himself here. That he is the son of God and that he's going to conquer the grave. Either you believe it or you don't. He's it. I mean, this is why he had to come to earth. This is why he had to die. This is the whole foundation of the gospel message that we were sinners, and because of our sin, there were no paths, there were no avenues to God, a perfect, holy God. And rather than being okay with being cut off from us, 
God sent Jesus at just the right time, as Romans 5, 6 says, to be the sacrifice for our sins and to restore us to a relationship, a connection to him, making that path available again. That's what it's all about. That's what we preach. That's what we believe. And if Jesus, like if there was some other way, Jesus doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to die. Now, this is a very basic truth for many of you in the room because we beat this to death at CCJ. The gospel message is our core belief. But it is, has implications that are so great that so many of us never realize. For so many of us that claim to be Christians, our pursuit of Christianity is nothing more than a moral path to truth. For us, hey, as long as I obey some commands, as long as I go to church, as long as I'm a good person, then I've found truth, then I've found what it's all about. And if that's you, you're missing the mark, and that's what I think allows so many Christians to kind of be open to plurality. Because if that's all we are, we really aren't any different than any other religion. Instead, what we are founded on is Jesus and a relationship and a connection to the one who conquered the grave. Not our work, but his work. I mean, we need to quit looking for philosophies. We need to quit looking for different paths. And we need to start looking for a person. It's Jesus Christ. So number one, Jesus' words are exclusive. But there's a second takeaway, and this is when it gets really good. Jesus' words are also inclusive. Incredibly inclusive. Now, if it sounds like I'm contradicting myself, I'm not. Yes, Jesus was very clear that he was the only way to truth. He was it, what he was doing. But he was also clear that that truth was open for anyone to receive. No one was going to be cut off from it. It's the most inclusive exclusivity that you could have. Try saying that three times. And it breaks my heart how many Christians want to use John 14, 6 as ammunition for their political and spiritual superiority. Totally take it out of context. I have to ask this morning, what do we have to be so arrogant about? Why are we so angrily acting like we have it all together? As Paul says, if we're going to boast, let's boast in Christ. He's the one that has done the work, and it's his sacrifice that is open for all people. That's what I love about our faith. As Daryl said last week, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Such a great thing. In fact, we got a chance to see that in context. That's the great thing about reading John 14, 6 in context, because we got to read just what was preceding it. Words we just read a minute ago in verse number two, where Jesus said, there is more than enough room in my Father's home. More than enough room in my Father's home. In fact, we've seen this verse butchered a lot at funerals out of the King James Version. You know, in my, in my, uh, you know, in my father's house, there's many mansions. The original Greek doesn't really say that at all. We're not moving into palatial homes. It's basically saying that in the original Greek that, yes, there is tons of room for us. God's not cutting it off. In fact, later on in chapter 14, when Jesus is kind of questioned by the disciples, he makes it clear that there's no prerequisites, there's no conditions on God's love. All he asks is that we believe and we follow him. And this is what I love about our faith, and this is what I love about our God, that it is open for everyone. There's not a certain type of socioeconomic status. There's not a certain race. There's not a certain kind of look. There's nobody that's too far gone or too messed up. He's not cutting it off at a certain point. It's not for a certain kind of person. Anybody, and I mean anybody, can come to Jesus. And this is what really sets us apart. And I don't say that out of arrogance because it's not my work. I mean, go compare this to what you see anywhere else. Go walk the streets of India and see the effects of Hinduism and the caste system on that society. You're not going to see this. Go to the Middle East and see how women and outsiders are treated in the midst of Islam. You're not going to see this. Go talk to someone about their belief in evolution and the survival of the fittest. You're not going to see this. Jesus may be the only truth, but that truth comes with open arms for everybody. Amen. And that's why I love it. It reminds me of words that Jesus speaks, a story he tells in Luke chapter 14 about a man that basically creates this big feast to have a festival, and he sends out one of his servants to invite guests. 
servant goes and everybody seems to have an excuse as to why they cannot come. One says, I, I just bought a new field. I plan on inspecting it. I, I can't come. Another said, I, I've bought five new oxen and I plan on testing them out. I, I, I cannot come. And still a third said, I am now married and I cannot come. I always laugh when I hear that because a lot of us men, we've used that excuse. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm stuck at home. I can't come. Jesus goes on to say that the master is outraged and he sends his servant to the streets and to the alleys to get the poor, to get the blind, to get the lame, to get the crippled. Invite them to the feast. And when they arrive, he declares there's still room for more and he sends out the servant to every home, to every corner, to every field he can find to declare there's still room in the banquet for anyone. And he compares it to the kingdom of God, to heaven. And he says, you know what? There's going to be some people who choose not to be a part of it. There's going to be some people who think that there's another truth that's more important. Or going to act like something else is more important. But it is open to everybody. Reminds me of a guy named Emmanuel. A man who was a part of the Rwandan genocide. In 1994, where 850,000 people were murdered. He was a man that was on the front lines of the violence, killing fathers and mothers, daughters and sons with a machete just because they were of a different tribe than him. He's since found Jesus, but still wrestles with the fact of his sin and the blood that's been on his hands and can't fathom how God could forgive him. He utters these words, I cannot pay my debt, yet somehow God has forgiven me. I don't understand it. I don't think I ever will. Somehow God has given me a second chance. It makes me think of Pastor Lee jong Ra of Seoul, South Korea, the subject of the latest documentary called The Dropbox. He, uh, him and his wife have built a box into the side of their home where people can drop off their babies rather than abandoning them to die on the streets, which is an epidemic in that city. They've saved hundreds of babies and adopted dozens themselves, all of which have some kind of uh, disformity or medical condition. People ask why, and he says, because there's no kid, there's no child that's too messed up or too disfigured for God. I want them to realize, their, want them to realize his love. In fact, in the midst of filming, Brian Ivey, the director of the film, who disliked Christians, became one. As he so eloquently puts it, I saw all these kids come through the drop box with disformities and disabilities, and eventually, like a heaven flash, I realized that I was one of those kids too, that I have a crooked soul, all this brokenness inside, but God still wanted me. me think, it makes me think of Craig Gross and the team at X Church who started handing out Bibles in 2006 at porn shows and sex bows to porn stars with the cover on their Bible that says Jesus loves porn stars. In nearly 10 years, they've handed out around 100,000 Bibles. And it's because of their love and grace for a group of people that so many look down upon that now dozens of women are leaving the porn industry as well as drug, drug abuse and prostitution. They're finding a relationship with Jesus getting married and realizing that they have a creator who loves them and unlike every other man they've ever met, isn't wanting to use them for something. He just wants to care for them. Church, again, I say it again. Yes, while Jesus is the only truth, that truth comes with open arms for everybody. God isn't wanting it for anybody to not experience it. It is as exclusive as it gets. He wants everybody to come home. He wants everybody to experience his love. He wants everybody to be in a right relationship with him. Yes, Jesus' words are incredibly ex exclusive, but they're also incredibly inclusive. And church, it's when we understand the balance between those two that we begin to realize what it looks like to follow Jesus Christ. And it is my prayer that here at CCJ that we would be a church full of individuals that align their lives as if Jesus is the only truth but love knowing that truth is for everybody. Man, that we would be passionate, yet outrageously loving. That we would be immovable, 
but unyieldingly gracious. That we would be focused and yet dangerously sacrificial. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that despite our sin, despite my sin, that you love us. That God, despite the fact that I fall short on a daily basis, despite the fact that we're a room full of people that fall short on a daily basis, you didn't abandon us. You didn't leave us on our own. You had a rescue plan through Jesus Christ. God, I pray we realize the gravity of that and that we wouldn't even be open to anything else being truth when we realize the power of what you've done for us and the grace and the love that we experience in it. And yet at the same time be a, true, a church that understands that that love and what you did is for everyone else too. That you didn't just come to save us, you came to save the world. God, may CCJ be a place that understands that and may a ripple effect come out of this place this morning of radical love for our world. I pray this in your name. Amen. We are going to go into a time that we celebrate every week called communion. And it's a time just to celebrate this balance. We get a chance to remember what Jesus did for us to restore us into a right relationship with God. Then now thanks to him, we now are in right standing. We have a hope and a future. By taking this bread uh, and this juice signifies the body and the blood that was poured out for our sins so that we could take hold of that exclusive claim that's for everybody. You can, if you call yourself a Christ follower, we ask that you join us in this moment. As the trays pass, you take the two cups that are in each, there's one in each slot with bread on the bottom, juice on top. Take it as you want to. Remember what has been done for you and celebrate that. Take it at any time during the song or as the band cuts out at the end.
shepherd roar, let fire flow, come shake the ground with the sound of revival. Let's have one right now. Come on.